Howdy folks, Spencer here, and today I want to go over a DPS flight path for Infected Space Elite. So before we get started, you know, th this guide is intended for those that are wanting to maximize their DPS potential in this one specific queue. The information should carry over to the other difficulties because the general positioning is the same for a variety of builds, but I am going to be doing a lot of things in this guide that are focused on torpedo timings, you know, some ability timings for torpedoes. In addition, you know, there are other factors that are going to heavily impact your performance capabilities in an infected run. Ability activation timings are huge. Your team composition is massive right now. And the overall server performance can impact how well your run goes. But regardless of that, this guide should give you at least the general idea on the positioning side of things. And I'm doing this as a live recording, so I apologize for any you know, errors you hear or anything like that. So I've got this guy or like this picture here that Reddit user Dodier had made. The link's hard to see here, but if you want to check out the PDF, it's linked down below and it links to it. But he put out a bunch of pictures way back, like seven plus years ago, showing the flank positions for infected. And if even if you're not in a ship that has flanking natively, if you're doing DPS, you should be using Intel as your primary specialization, which means that you do have flanking on any ship. So Intel primary, temp op secondary is basically the meta for anything DPS wise right now. You're going to be flanking most things in a run, but you are not going to be flanking the Stark. Okay. You, you, the, I know I've seen people do this. I don't know why, but do not flank the start group, okay? Before you begin, you're going to want to go to your fleet star base and grab some of these skill boost items. They last for four hours each, and they're only like 2,500 fleet credits per, so they're pretty cheap to get. And they just give you plus 10 to each of the stats. So there's an engineering version, science, tack. You can run all three, and it gives you plus 10 to all your skills. They're not that huge, but it's, a, it's nice to have them. And then I've got these a prototype of Blade of Jevonite hardpoints, and these just give you some starship hull capacity. I'm going to hop in the game quick and show you just an example of what these are like. You can buy these off the exchange for like 120 to 150,000 EC per. They last for 15 minutes. They're, they're pretty handy. So right now, just sitting here, I am at 110k HP on my... United Earth Defense Vessel. Oh, that just jumped up because I started moving. So 116k. Now, boosting your hull capacity is important because of the Tyler's Duality trait. It gives you crit chance based on your hull capacity. So right now I'm at 4.9%. If I go and activate this prototype of Blade of Jevonite, it'll take a minute for this to update to reflect the stat change. So give it a second. I just jumped from like 115k up to 132.6. And I was at 4.9% with Tyler's Duality, and now I'm at 5.4. So that's an extra 0.5% crit chance, and I have increased hull capacity, which means that my survivability is going to be increased throughout the run. So these prototype of Blade of Jevonite hardpoints, you can get them from DOF packs. There's a duty officer chain that can get them. You convert the Jevonite thingies over to them. And like I said, you can also just go and buy them off the exchange. And they, they can even be cheaper sometimes, like 100k for them right now. They're not going to be 100k by the time you guys see this video because I'm going to buy them all up. Because I go through these things like there's no tomorrow. Yeah, I bought up cheap ones. Sorry, guys. Back on track, um, you know, those those are some important skill boosts. There's also some duty officer missions that give you skill boosts that are pretty helpful. So, you know, just run whatever you can that's going to help you out. Now, if we're actually getting into the map, you know, there's three different ways for you to load in. You can load in from the ground. You can load in from system space. So above Earth Space Dock, New Romulus, Deep Space Nine. Um... And you can load in from sector space. Now, 
you want to be loading in from either sector space or from ground. If you load in from system space, there's an additional warp in animation that's going to eat up some of your prep phase time. So I've got a video here. And I'll spend a minute just going over this with you guys. So on the left, I have a character that's a control loading in from ground. And on the right, like these were both going at the exact same time, so. Sector space and ground basically loaded in same time. If I go for system space here, so like above the Romulus, like I had just been when I activated that Gemini to show you guys. You'll notice this character on the left just loads right in. But look at that, there was like 50 seconds on the briefing phase, and then if I look this right character has this warping animation and it's in at like 43 seconds. So you can see how loading in from system space is not ideal. And now I'll load both in from ground. It's going to take it a minute because sometimes the game is a bit slow to load maps. And these, these, both clients were just open on my desktop right next to each other. Look at that. They're, they're both in super fast from ground. So you get the point with that. If you load in from ground or sector space, you load into the map fast and you have more time in prep phase. You load in from system space and you're losing time. And ultimately, if you're with a, using a torpedo build, you're losing DPS by loading in from system space because you need to use the prep phase to spam mines. So what I'm going to do now... I've, I've got some text on the screen, and the basic summary of this is you're hitting TAC initiative, or you have a teammate cast it on you. You're hitting the Kobayashi Maru device to get the boost it provides, and then you're going to spam your mines, chemosite, and you're going to just spam the just as many mines out as you can. So let me, let me find where I saved my run. The run we're going to have as the background for this is my recent record. I will note my piloting was not perfect and does not follow everything in this guide, but you know, this should give a basic idea. So I loaded in from sector space. I had 47 so seconds. I instantly, let me go back here. As soon as I got in, I hit my tack initiative, my mines and the chemo site. And then I launched the Tetrion mine or not Tetrion, the uh, the colony tricobalt mines that we've been testing to replace the modulating mines. That's a recent change since my torp guide. Um, so I, you know, during the start of the prep phase, I am, like I say here, hit tack initiative and then just, you know, spam mines. So I didn't have the Kobayashi Maru device out myself, but my teammates are hitting it for me. And I'll just go through this one more time. You know, I get in the map, I hit my attack initiative, the mine pattern, the chemo site. And then I'm starting it out by hitting my tricobalt mine and then my mines are all auto firing the rest of the time. So I'm going to go back to the spread or the, the slideshow. And then we have the later part of the preparation phase. This is the Tenor approach. Tenor is the one that has held the record for most of the year. He has been a very valuable resource for me as I've gone back into the game and really gotten into these torp boats over the years. So a lot of the credit for this goes to Tenor. So at 20 seconds with uh, tw 20 seconds left on the prep phase timer, you're going to hit your high yield and ETM uh, trigger. And the purpose of this is to have a high yield and spread already loaded for when you're engaging the starting group. That means that Right after those fire, you'll have another high yield ready for you to hit, and then you'll have another one out that you can launch. So it's just a matter of really min-maxing and getting as much performance out of your ship as possible. At 17 seconds, you're going to hit emergency power to engines. This will give you better timing throughout the run to trigger the emergency con hologram and reset evasive maneuvers. And this very much applies to ISA also. I don't think Tenor is the one that originated this idea because you see other DPSers like MB doing this in his ISA runs. And the emergency powered engines at 17 seconds is something that basically everyone on the team should be doing to help make sure that they can move around the map at the proper speed and timing. So 
everyone should be hitting emergency powered engines at 17 seconds, and then you can hit your emergency powered weapons if you're on an energy weapon build at two seconds right before you go in. So the timing still works out quite well for torps or non torp builds. At 10 seconds, you'll hit your attack and intel fleets. As the DPS player, you should be hitting them first, so you don't have to worry about them throughout the run. At 6 seconds, you're going to hit a bunch of your big damage boost abilities like Phase Space Membrane, Alpha, Go Down Fighting. And then around the same, sometime between 6 and 4 seconds, you're going to be hitting your evasive maneuvers. Because you're going to be in red alert, so you can't just full impulse in, which is, would be non-optimal anyways because the Phase Space Membrane. So you're going to use that evasive to get in against that first group. So what I'm going to do now is show you that, like the rest of this prep phase here from the 2.09 mil run I did the other day. Now on my parser, it's not going to show 2.09. It was one of the teammates that had it. My my side of the parser was like 2.06. The, the full run will be shown at the end of this video. So I'm just continuing to hit mine. So let me go back a second because I didn't narrate it. At 20 seconds, I'm hitting my high yield and scatter volley. At 17 seconds, I'm hitting the emergency power to engines. I'm continuing to spam mines out as much as possible. 10 seconds, TAC fleet, intel fleet. Then I hit vulnerability assessment, phase space membrane. All that right around the times that I already discussed. And then I start moving towards the first group. So let's go back to the slides. You know, we're going straight in up against the first group. I don't do this flanking thing on the first group that I see some people do. I don't know anybody in these record setting environments. That is every time I know Augie was a fan of it and I think he's moved away from it, but Attempting to flank the first group is slowing you down and ultimately is just a DPS loss because the first group needs to be going down so fast that you spending five seconds to get to the other side is just killing your DPS, your spike at the start. So starting group, as you go in, you're going to target the TAC cube. You're going to hit a bunch of abilities on that TAC cube. I've got them all listed here. And you're going to try and position yourself about two to three kilometers away from the TAC cube. When the TAC cube gets to around 30 to 40% HP left, you want to target the right cube. Because you want to, the, the TAC cube is going to die with all the dots and AOE still hitting it. But you need to make sure that that right cube is going down. And then once the right cube goes down, the TAC cube should already be dead. And the left cube should only need a torp or two, ideally, as you head to the side. And because evasive maneuvers will still be on cooldown at this point, you're going to use a deuterium surplus to move to the left side. So let's watch the starting group from my point of view. So as I go in, I hit the steam runner console because you can hit it from really far out. And then I'm going to hit my relocate mines, my concentrate firepower, fall emergency artillery, Rapid emitting armaments is triggered by the tractor beam, so that's why you want to make sure you're not too close because it will kill you. Then I'm trying to target the right cube when I notice that the attack cube's about down. And in this run, this left cube was just not going down anywhere as fast as normal, so that's one area where this run was messed up. Now, we're at the left side, and I'm going to go back to the guide here. You're going to use your deuterium surplus to get over to the left side. You're going to want to position yourself three kilometers in front of the transformer with your elevation yeah, elevation about even with the top of the transformer. You're going to mark concentrate firepower on the transformer and then hit a call emergency artillery as soon as possible. You're going to spam EBM high yields on the transformer, and then you're going to use ETM triggers as available to spam some neutronic spreads to help take out the rear generators. As the transformer hits 5 to 10% hit points, you're going to activate evasive maneuvers and any firing modes that you can to trigger the comp engine's speed boost, and you're going to get to the right side as fast as possible. So let's watch the left side. Or actually, before I do, I've got some pictures here of where the positioning should be. You see how I'm like lined up between these two close generators? And then my elevation is near the top of the transformer. 
with this elevation, this would be the ideal position to me because then I can have a spread come out of the scimitar here or whatever ship I'm in and hit these back generators. You wanna try and get those generators out as fast as possible. You're, that's the goal of your team really, but you can help them as the DPS player by positioning yourself in a, at a point like this where your spreads can hit them. So that was a mistake I made on this run. So let me go back and show the transition to left. So my positioning was a little bit off here, as you can see. And I don't really turn my camera as much as I should, so it might be hard for you guys to see. The thing was, I was at least still in the flank position. And as the transformer is going down, I've already hit my evasive and I'm getting over to that other side as fast as possible. I'm not hitting the middle group. You'll worry about that later on in the run. And then you see me doing the exact same thing basically on the right side. My positioning on the right side was much better. So I'm gonna go back to this slideshow. You see me, I'm going crossing to the right. You do not stop for the crap at the middle. You'll be getting a lot of DPS from them in a minute. Right side follows the exact same trend as the left side. You're just going to hit relocate mines because that ability is back up for you. And that'll help clear out the generators and the spheres that spawn in. You're going to then go to the trans or as the transformer nears five to 10% hit points, you're going to leave using evasive or deuterium surplus to get to the gate as soon as possible. And then just showing the exact same positioning idea here, position yourself, you know, in line with these uh, close generators essentially, but at the same elevation where you can hit these back ones. And then we're going to go to the gate. So at the gate, or let me, I guess I should show the right side going down here. So the, the left to right transition cubes or the transformer is going from about five, 10%. Then I go to right side and I'm trying to position myself about where I mentioned there using whatever I can as they become available. And then as it's going down, I'm getting over to the gateway as soon as possible. So let's go back to the slideshow. At the gate, you want to position yourself between the gate and the tack cube. About two to three kilometers away from the gate is ideal. You're going to be dropping your anti-time entanglement and, re and refracting Tetrion Cascade on the gate as soon as possible. Ideally, wait for your teammates to have stuff gravelled up there, though. You're going to mark concentrate firepower and hit call emergency artillery on the gate as soon as possible. Same as every other point of the run. And you should have your AOE consoles is starting to become available again. If you've been using your uncon triggers throughout the run, you're going to want to hit your phase space membrane as soon as it's available. And remember to either hit your own oxbat when it has 15 seconds left on the phase space membrane timer or call for a team battery. If you're in a coordinated environment. You're going to spam high yield EBMs until the, you see most of the spheres are dead. And then you're going to swap the high yield Delphix. And when you see the gate gets to about five to 10% HP, you're going to activate evasive or deuterium and turn 180 degrees to hit the tack cube. So let's see how the gate plays out going off of right side. There were a few mistakes on my part from this with my positioning, but it all worked out in the end. You see, I'm trying to focus on firing my Delphix here now that all the spheres are dead. And then I'm turning 180 degrees to go to the tack cube. So going back to presentation, you know, you're turning 180 degrees. Position yourself two to three kilometers away from the tack cube. You don't want to accidentally kill yourself with the re. You can get closer once the rapid emitting armaments uh, torps have hit, but try to generally stay about that two kilometers away. Mark concentrate firepower and call emergency artillery on the target as soon as possible. Hit relocate mines at any other buffs you have, and you're going to exclusively spam high yield Delphix. And as I say here, you're going to hope that your team is able to keep the attack cube shields offline because keeping those shields offline is a major challenge for your team, but that is the key to getting a really high number. So let's watch the tack cube play out. 
So you see me two to three kilometers away. I have to back up to just over three to launch my Steam Runner console in this case. And then I'm just getting really close and spamming Delphix. Now I have the audio muted, but I will go back here and turn it up. As my phase space membrane is, I, I call out for an oxbat here. Let me go back. I call out for an oxbat because my phase space membrane is draining my ox power, and I need a an, a boost to my ox power to keep the phase space membrane damage boost up. Oxbat. Is there anything? I don't see anything. I don't see anything either. Nice. So as I mentioned earlier, this run showed up at as being like 2.065 on my side, but a teammate had it at 2.089. So that is why it's uploaded as like the, the 2.9 record on or 2.09 record on the table. So now we're at the end of the video. And as I mentioned at the start, you know, piloting is only one factor that contributes to your DPS your ability timings and your general team composition are massive factors that are going to influence your performance capabilities in a run. And finding a really good team out there is really difficult right now. There's not many groups really running the high-end stuff, and the ones that are running high-end runs have requirements that not every DPS player can meet. Like, if you've looked at any of my streams over the past month or two, you're going to see that I have dedicated support in tank characters, and that is pretty much a base requirement for the group that I generally run with, the DPS fanatics. If you are at that level right now, it's the, the mindset has shifted to if you want to be supported, you have to be able to support back. So when you look at my streams, I spend 75% of the time that we're doing these runs on a non-DPS character. I'm going to play two videos now to end this video. Uh, but before I start them, I do want to say thank you for watching. If you have any questions or comments, just leave them down below and I will get back to you when I can. I hope that this overall the video wasn't too bad audio wise. I have not done any audio editing for the first bit of the video. Uh, I just did a live take one shot and just went with it. But that's it for this video. Now enjoy the current record run I did at 2.09 mil. And then afterwards, enjoy my first run over two mil that I did with my newer DPS character.